Venom Astera, the Mark Pryor of StarCraft II, covering a game from the Mark Pryor of StarCraft II. That is Fruit Dealer. Now, who's Mark Pryor? Mark Pryor is probably my favorite baseball player ever. He was a right-handed ace for the Chicago Cubs in the early 2000s, who every Cub fan thought was going to save the team and break the curse. He was the second overall pick in the late 90s. So hard-throwing righty. He was like my childhood hero. This was before I discovered StarCraft. And what happened to Mark Pryor was he was god tier for a season and a half and then had a bunch of severe injuries and was never the same. And everyone was waiting for him to come back to prime form. And he grinded and grinded and grinded and never got back to the top. And it was a really sad story, but we can look back with reverence at the peak of his career and really revel in how great he was. That's what I did during my Fruit Dealer, the first great Korean Zerg video, an hour and a half masterpiece, one of my best videos ever, quite frankly. And in that video, and in the last video I did, game one of the series, we spoke at great length about how flimsy Zerg was in the first few months of StarCraft II. These matches occurred about uh, six months after StarCraft II was released, six, seven, eight months. So this was really the beginning of the period of it's no longer people doing beta builds and just slamming tier one units into each other idiotically, trying to run up ramp when you see the sentry and you're like, oh, I hope he misses his force field, LOL. Tasteless just love to make fun of that, by the way. Those Terran players who would do a three racks all in and see like, oh, there's a sentry up there. I hope he's not watching his ramp, LOL, and would like just try to stem up into the sentry. You saw quite a bit of that as we see a barracks action coming out here for Thorazine. And that's CC first. This is Terminus. It's a big macro map. And this was a map that was a response to Steps of War and the really bad Season 1 GSL map pool. A lot of people were saying, look, this, the maps, they're too short. There's rush distance, that is, you know, the rush distance is too short. It's too small, claustrophobic. Tasteless used to say, uh, we're playing on Steps of War here. It's going to be, well, that sounds like more like Rick Sanchez, but they're fighting each other in a telephone booth. Oh, okay, here we go. But in those games you would oftentimes oh my god he killed the drone is this everything is going wrong for fruit dealer and a lot of times when you watch fruit dealer it's like you see the brilliance that he used to have and the stuff that he does just doesn't work anymore or people are prepared for it and it would be akin to watching mark Pryor years after his severe injuries, throwing the fastball that used to crackle lively at 97, and it's a tepid 89. And it's a great tragedy in many instances, but I've always been very open on this channel about covering different games, not just covering the ones where the people that I like win. And, uh, you know, to prove it, I did all of Idra's GSL games, and Idra never made round the four in GSL, which is a travesty in its own regard. And when we look at Idra's GSL run, there were a lot of different times where he was right on the precipice of making it to the next round and something corny happened that had to do with map imbalance or Zerg being terrible. The biggest example that comes to mind is when he was 1v he was 1-1 against the best Terran player in Wings of Liberty history, MVP, and for whatever reason Blizzard hadn't fixed the close position spawns on map, so even though Idra beat him on the incredibly Terran favorite Steps of War, which should be unwinnable for Zerg against a guy like MVP, they spawned in close positions on Metalopolis as the Roach Rush is revealed here. So this is a what I consider to be like a very weak and uninspired two-base Roach build. And for a guy like Fruit Dealer who lived on aggression and really benefited from playing an aggressive in-your-face style, because remember, if you always try to defend, 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 and only make drones on tiny-ass maps, then you're just going to get rolled over and die a lot. So he developed this aggressive style, but you're playing on Terminus here. The Terran player is able to get a bunker out before you get a single shot off. These are the terrible three-range roaches. These roaches can't hit them. They can't run up and like hit the Marines behind the racks. I know that might sound weird, but the range was so low that if you park with a wall in here, you can defend easily. And 
we see link speed being delayed, just now being researched, and I sort of wonder if Fruit Dealer is just going to flood drones behind this, and he does. Eight drones in the production tab. So an intelligent player is able to realize that, okay, I can make 20 more roaches, and I'm not going to be able to hold. Or I'm not going to be able to break him, rather. Like, he has too many buildings in the way, and presumably he's teching up to something that's going to defend this, whether it be a Banshee or Marauders or a tank. You know, whenever you do an early roach all in and it gets scouted like it did, then the Terran player is going to be preparing for it. Now, the initial preparation was the bunker behind the barracks, but then the subsequent preparation is what you sort of go into the next phase of your build. Marauders here are the choice. I love the Marauders here. Marauders, of course, do bonus damage to armored units, and at this time you had to research siege mode. And since Thorzane went for a multi-racks opener, his factory was delayed. So if he went for a factory sort of siege play, it just wouldn't have been out in time. They're very smart to go into the Marauder. And very smart of Thorzane to move across the map with Marines and scout around. Again, Terran players really relied on the Hellion at this time to scout. Of course, the Reactor Hellion build was sort of established right at the beginning of 2011, I would say. Because even though... Players would make Hellions for the first few months the game was out. It was much more common to see like extended bio play, two racks openings, three racks openings. So it is very crucial to note that even though Marcus Eklaw Thorzane here went for a multiple barracks opener, he was able to defend that big scary roach all in without splash. And how did he do that? Scouting and then making the right units and building positioning. I think it's really important to note small things like this as we see Lair Tech. Actually, it can't be Lair Tech because Galil Constitution, Burrow, and uh, Bane Speed, Centrifugal Hooks are in the production tab, but the Hatchery is in the main still. So presumably, the yeah, we saw it just there at the bottom, the Lair is actually at the natural. And why is that relevant? You might be saying, well, Venomous, like, who cares? You just missed it. That's because Thorzane's going to scan the man. It's Terrans will always scan the man to look for tech as he scans to clear a creep and sees, okay, he does have lair. But remember, in game one, Thorzane scanned and saw hatch tech and knew that he was being all in and made a huge wall. Some decent splits going on there, but without Metavax, it's really more about sponging the shots with the Marauders and... That's another interesting thing about Wings of Liberty versus Legacy of the Void, is in Legacy, it's so easy to get up to Starport just because of the way that the economy booms so quickly and how efficient the workers are that at this point in a Legacy game, no matter what happened in the early game, we would have seen Metavax and the Terran player would have been able to run away there. Here, because of the build that the Zerg did and because of the way that the economy ramps up, we're seeing extended bio play. And this is allowing for a more interesting back and forth as again, burrowed banelings are being attempted, but they are scanned. That's just, uh, that's one weird thing about trying to burrow banelings is like a lot of times there's going to be creep, so they're going to scan anyway. And here Roachling is going to try to defend a little bit of Marine Marauder, but Fruit Dealer really needs those speed bands to finish. You can't be fighting Roaches into Marine Marauder, especially in these numbers, but the speed bands come out and they kill a good portion of the bio. And remember, double factory just completed for Thorzane. The Spire about halfway done for Fruit Dealer. Fruit Dealer is getting plus one. And this is, no, notice how this game dynamically scaled with the openers. And Legacy of the Void, they have so few options to do in the early game because the Reaper is so out of control that you don't see diverse openings like this. You see the same ostentatious garbage over and over and over. And even though the third base on this map is very, very easy to take, we can see that it only had one gas. So even in a meta where everyone knew it was rough for Zerg and the maps needed to be bigger, there was still a trade-off of like, well, we, uh, we can't just give them that easy third base. We've got to take a gas away. But this was definitely considered a map that on the heels of Steps of War and these terrible rush maps was way, way better and more balanced and produced better games. 
and Thorzane doing something incredibly intelligent that all of you should emulate in your own play, both in StarCraft 1 and 2, which is he has a single Marine patrolling the exterior main bases. This is so smart because the Zerg does not want to take one of those middle bases right by a tower that's easily aggressed upon as a drop here. We'll force a mineral line to be pulled as the mutas come out. And Fruit Dealer was known as a guy who cut a lot of corners, and honestly, in, in the early days of StarCraft II, you literally had to. I mean, if you didn't cut corners, you literally couldn't win. But the Pult Viking is going to be cleared here by the Mutas, as it has two kills already. That's always so nice whenever you go Mutas and can kill that Infernal Viking. Blast that Viking. It's so irritating as Zurich. When I'm Terran and I'm TVZ and I make that Pult Viking every single game. But I just love that marine on patrol of the left side of the map. You always want to have units spread out on the exterior bases, especially against Zerg players, because Zerg loves to just run wild with expansions. They'll sneak a corner base on you. Zerg wants to expand, 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 and we see Fruit Dealer going for some harass. And again, Thorzane scans and clears the burrowed banes. And I love the fact that the Fruit Dealer the legendary Korean Zerg keeps trying to do these burrowed baneling plays. If the if man, I love the scans too. This is such a high level game, especially for early 2011. Absolutely love this because it really shows that Fruit Dealer understands it's going to be very hard to win a macro game with standard mutiling bane because my creep spread has been abated so severely. Thorzane is consistently punched in since the early game and again he scans. This is brilliant, fastidious, patient play and the fact that he was able to accrue a third base for free, what is essentially a pocket base, means that you have more scan energy. It's sort of like being able to take a faster third in Brood War against Protoss and you can get that third scanner and then when you're doing your Vulture tank pushes, holy crap, I actually have enough where I can get to their base and still have scan. With tank being knocked out there, but really good micro by Thorzane to stem the units that were near the mutas and try to focus down mutas. Thorzane's playing just exceptionally well. As far as Foreigner Terran goes, Jinro was around at this time and Juanito, aka Special or Major, was around at this time. But once Thorzane went into this tournament, he really established a name for himself as he picks off that fourth base and Roach Bane is going to come in here. A beautiful spread of tanks as beautiful, beautiful defensive play being displayed from Thorzane as he doesn't just have everything rallied across the map. He's already running back to deal with these roaches. And I said it once, I'll say it a million times, these are early Wings of Liberty roaches. They can run in your base and they're really not gonna get a lot of damage done as we see more burrowed banelings here. Every little tactical edge that Fruit Dealer can try to pull off, he's pulling out in this game. I love his micro and his moxie. He's a player that you can really feel the soul of when you watch. And again, I just want to point out that doesn't this look like so much different and so much cooler than a game that you would see now? Hasn't this game played out? micro macro decisions? This game is so much different than anything you'd see in Legacy of the Void. And Artosis once said that he could cast an entire game of StarCraft II based on the production tab. It didn't used to be like that in Wings of Liberty, and certainly not with Fruit Dealer. And that Marine on the left side of the map has just been worth its weight in gold. Fruit Dealer restricted to three bases, he's Larva Starved, he's Gas Starved, and T-Funk is going to bring the hammer down. Turrets coming up, multiple tanks sieging for it. The fourth base has been established and it's a PF. Fruit Dealer knows that he's incredibly far behind and he's going to have to pull out a little bit of a trump card here with the Nidus. He's going to try to Nidus up at that third base, up at that 12 o'clock. And remember, in a lot of games, Fruit Dealer would have been able to take the left side base or sneak an upper base because the Terran has been fastidious about having a marine patrolling up there. Man, oh man, it is so annoying. You send a drone up there and it doesn't work. You send a drone up there and what the heck, my drone died. You send a drone over there to make it and what the heck, it didn't. So it's just, it's a very vexing thing to play against someone who is very focused on map control and understands the importance of it 
And speaking of the importance of map control, we're going to see a Nidus here in the smoke. We do. So Nidus at this time, it was 200, 200, way more expensive, way bigger risk. And here's why that's a good thing, because you shouldn't just be able to flip Nidus coins like we saw Rogue win a bunch of tournaments with. But this is going to be it. Uh, T-Funk is up in bases. Fruit Dealer is completely all in with this Nidus. He really should throw another down. And at this time, look how bad the Nidus is. Not only does it cost more, but it spits out units at such a slow rate. This is why it was really underused for years and years and years. It's one of those things that like Blizzard was just begging Zergs to use and just buffed it to the point where it was out of control like the old Raven. Lair goes down there and T-Funk is starting to have his main rotted out, but he has so many unit producing structures and so many units that he will be able to hold and stabilize and he's gonna kill Fruit Dealer way before Fruit Dealer kills him. And even though the Ebays and Armories die, it doesn't matter. Like his plus three, his attack is gonna finish. You think the Zerg player is anywhere close to him in upgrades, doing all these burrowed banelings and getting all those mutas? The Zerg player is way behind in supply, way behind in upgrades as T-Funk has beautifully expanded as we see a Nidus in the top left here as finally Fruit Dealer is going to try to get some left side control after being denied by that Marine the whole time. And that's one of those things where you Nidus over there and you're like, Jesus, like where have my drone, like why can't I expand over here? Like what is over here that's preventing me from taking these bases is Fruit Dealer GG's and this is a best of three, so Fruit Dealer eliminated from the TSL, and after this, he never does anything in a major tournament. And after about another year of disappointment and weird all any games that looked like that, he retires. And it's sort of a tragedy in many instances, and for a lot of people, because he was considered such a god. But Thorzane on the come up, that was one of his first big wins ever, and he's going to have a great run in this tournament. I will be covering some of the subsequent games, sub for more.